welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Corley Lawrenson, part of the S&P Global Team, and today is a particular treat for me, and I hope as well for you. I get to speak with not one, but four Stanford professors, and we're going to talk about what is new at Stanford. Um, and it has been a really eventful year for the energy sector of Stanford. We're going to hear from that. There's a strong sense of excitement. And above all, which I find really striking, there's a huge sense of purpose. Um, there's a sense that the school wants to make a difference to the monumental challenge that is climate change. So this is the session where we get to hear all about that. Um, I've got some questions prepared, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, please prepare your questions for the panel, and we will move to um, ask them in due course. So it is um, an honor to welcome uh, the panel today. Let me present, we have Yi Kui, who is the director of the Precourt Institute for Energy. Welcome, Yi, thank you. Thank you. Naomi Bonas, who is managing director of the National Gas Initiative, as well as co-managing director of the Hydrogen Initiative, so lots to talk about there. And we have Arun Majumdar, who is dean of the Doer School of Sustainability. Welcome, Arun and Thomas Jaramillo, who is Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering and Director of the SunCat Center. So I've probably missed out a lot of your titles or accomplishments, but in the interest of time, we're gonna move forward with the, um, with the session. So I think to start off, we're gonna, or I'd like you to tell us about Stanford and what do you do in the energy space? And to start with the beginning, I wanna bring you in, Aaron, please, and if you could tell us the big news this year is the new Doer School of Sustainability. That is new, you are the first dean. Can you tell us about that? Well, let me first th thank you for having us all here. Let me first ask, how many Stanford alums out here? Okay, so the big news is that Lake Lagunita is full because of the <laughs> torrential rains we've had. That's an amazing thing because it hasn't happened for a long time. You're very lucky that's all the rain that was due in Europe and hasn't come. <laughs> With that big news behind us, um, the door school, obviously this has been in the making for the last five years. This didn't happen overnight. But it, in the scheme of academic time scale, it is kind of overnight because most, a lot of that happened during the pandemic. And you know, when our new president and provost came in in 2016, they had a listening tour of uh, all the faculty, students, and uh, you know, uh, stakeholders and all. And the issues of energy, water, food, uh, biodiversity, and all of these related issues all emerged and, and, and it was all grouped under sustainability and climate change affects all of them. And so then the question was, what could we do about it? And the proposal of a school, Tom and I were in a committee together to propose, we always do things in committees, by the way, in academia, and so we proposed a school because we wanted to go big, and Stanford has not started a school in 75 years. This is the first one, mm -hmm. and, and we only have seven schools, and this issue is different from many of the issues we were tackled before because this is not just a business school issue or a law school or an engineering assignment. It's all of the above. So why form a school? Well, we've got to recruit some faculty. We've got to you know, admit students, give degrees, develop curriculum. That's a kind of school function, and that's needed. New curricula, new educational programs, et cetera. But it's also, we needed to form a connective tissue across whole campus. So the institutes were brought in. And essentially what we have formed is a microcosm of the whole campus with partnerships with the outside world in a three-legged stool structure, departments, institutes, and this new thing called the accelerator to think about scale from the beginning and so that we can develop solutions with that in mind, scalability in mind, with partnerships. That's what has been instituted right now. And we are in the second quarter. We're only one and a half quarters old. But the thinking has been going on for a long time. And we're gonna, we are really super excited about it. And so when you, when you think ahead, you know, what are your, do you have targets for this year, for five years down the road, for 10 years down the road? Do you, do you know more or less where you want to be, what you want to be able to accomplish? Well, in, in, this is, in many ways, the school is like a startup, but it's also a merger. We have joint appointments with every other school, with faculty. This is new. So many joint appointments at one shot never quite happened. So we are, we are figuring out 
how that merger, you know, these, as you, some of you may have been involved in mergers, these take some time, yeah. right? To blend together, to bring us common values and culture together. But there's no, and there's no question that we are gonna you know, focus on recruiting talent and fostering talent. Um, new education, world-class education, in sustainability, all of these issues that are laid out before. And this accelerator is a very important part of it. And we're launching a third institute in addition to Precourt Institute for Energy and the Woods Institute for Environment is the Institute for Sustainable Societies, Urban Infrastructure, Environmental Justice, Equity Issues, and all of the governance issues, as well as, you know, how, what, what do we value? We got, you know, we have science and engineering on one hand, and we have social sciences, econo economics, and law on the other. So the, usually they remain in the schools. Now we have all in one school, so we got to make sure that their values are, are aligned with those. Values of curiosity-driven research, of you know, blue sky discovery-focused research, as well as the solution-focused research, R&D. So those values have to be created, and they, they take some time. So you're building links between all of these That's initiatives, right. right? Okay, so ye, um, within the Dover School of Sustainability that uh, Aaron was telling us about, you head up the Precourt Institute. Can you tell us about that? Sure. But let me just mention the Lake Lacunita again, Alun. She's full of water, it's looking beautiful. So I'm moving closer to the lake, right across the street from Mark Sobeck. I think Mark Sobeck sitting right there, we <laughs> will become neighbor. So very exciting. Stanford alumni, welcome back soon before the lake dries up. <laughs> um, so Prickle Institute uh, has been around for more than a decade, roughly building on previously global climate energy project. Actually, I took over this position from Alun and Sally Benson. This is a big ecosystem in energy, working on science, engineering, technology, uh, economics, and policy, and technology translation as well related to energy. For example, over the past about seven years, starting from natural gas initiatives, started by Mark Zobeck, uh, the Beach and Watch Initiative, uh, that's uh, for electric grid and hydrogen. Naomi is right here. Well, actually, Naomi also managing the Natural Gas Initiative as well, Storage X. So there is a systematic plan to start initiative to tackle those areas, those sectors with carbon emission. How do we do that? You know, forming a sector with significant industry support. Yet at the same time, we recognize um, it's very important to have finance policy, technology translation, global engagement coming in. So this I call as interwoven fabric of Stanford ecosystem really bring together roughly about 300 faculty members, a thousand students. Uh, actually SunCat is part of the ecosystem Tom is directing, this is a DOE center. So this is really, really uh, nice, we really have the vision. I think the foundation for Alun mentioned the new school formation because this is the experiment bring all the expertise across the campus together you know, over a decade ago. Now building on that, now we have the uh, school. So it's a natural, I think, leading to the school formation. I'll take a pause right here for now. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds very exciting. Um, Naomi, do you want to tell us about the hydrogen and gas initiatives and possibly your comment on the lake as well? Uh, I have I have no comment on the lake. Um, yeah, You're Stanford no, alum. Though. I am Stanford alum. That's true. I've run around Lake Lagunita many times. Um, so uh, yeah, I focus on both natural gas and hydrogen. Um, you know, both of those initiatives were um, initiated with an understanding of how natural gas and hydrogen could aid in decarbonization. And we're really proud to be part of the School of Sustainability um, and within the Precourt Institute for Energy. And we share that sense of purpose um, around sustainability and around implementing um, climate actions in a very um, direct and um, impactful way. We have a short duration to make a big change here. So. Um, off the back of uh, the Natural Gas Initiative, which has had a lot of success in working with industry um, to uh, solve problems like methane leaks, uh, for example, 
Um, we recognized about three years ago how important hydrogen was going to be mm -hmm. uh, for decarbonization. And we um, spent those three years building a community at Stanford. And I think one of the really great things um, about the new School of Sustainability is that it has really enabled um, a, a multidisciplinary approach to some of these problems. And hydrogen is such a, a great example of that, right? We bring together the uh, traditional energy community with the technology community of Silicon Valley, with the investment community, and with all of the NGOs in this uh, wonderful um, partnership to use hydrogen to accelerate decarbonization. Good. Now that sounds that sounds really fantastic, um, Thomas. I, I want to turn to you now. Of course, um, I think. Can you tell us about the Suncat Center and possibly about the accelerator as well? Is Absolutely. That, uh, yeah, because that sounds like something that's very exciting. You were, um, a few of you mentioned relationships, partnerships with the industry. So let's hear about that. Yeah, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, first of all, yeah, Suncat as a center, we're a team of 16 senior personnel and about 70 or 80 students and postdocs, all really working towards sustainable fuels and chemicals. So how to produce them using sustainable feedstocks, using renewable energy, how to make use of them in more effective ways than we currently do today, uh, how to use molecules as a means for long duration storage. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are very key topics. Um, we're really very tech focused, science, engineering, experiment, computational to address challenges in that space. We work on molecules like hydrogen, supported through the uh, hydrogen initiative. We work on carbon dioxide conversion. We work on ammonia. We work on hydrocarbon chemistries. So that's very, very tech centric. Uh, the beauty of Stanford, among the many things I could say here to complete that sentence, is that we're really a one-stop shop of scholars that work in many scholarly areas. We're not, we're not all about science and engineering. We have amazing, we have a law school, and we have a business school, we have a school of medicine, and now a school of sustainability. It's at that level, and so really what we're trying to do is build that, that ecosystem of scholars saying, the future that we're trying to create together, we can't just put blinders on and work in our own discipline and, and, and say, oh, I got there. We reached where we wanted to be, and then it doesn't plug into the rest of the societal framework. So we need new forms of, of government regulation. We need innovation in finance. We need uh, sociology. How, do, how does society adopt and adapt, and the technology, and oceans, and atmosphere, and subsurface? All of this has to work together, and that's really what the school brings. And then there's another dimension to all of this, and that is, well, what can we do differently other than you know, bringing everyone together? That's great, but how can we do more? And that's really what the accelerator is aiming to do. The way I look at it, universities have had a, a massive impact on society. It's, it's just not direct, meaning we, what are universities, what are we really good at? We're really good at education and basic research. Those are the fundamental pillars mm -hmm. of a university. And look at thousands of movers and shakers at this conference, right? Going through universities, setting foundations for education, and, and, and how many people are contributing to the world today. The basic research is turning into the technologies that are the solar cells that we see deployed, new catalysts and oil refineries, et cetera. A lot of that came from basic researchers, research coming from universities. And then the question is, how can we have a more rapid and direct impact to address the urgency and the scale of the problem? And uh, basic research and education is not exactly the fastest path, but we do have the scholarly potential with 2,000 faculty, 17 plus thousand students, thousands of staff, and we just have to create the right types of avenues. And the accelerator is designed to do exactly that, is to create avenues that can more rapidly accelerate the basic research and education kind of mission and say we've got the scholarly potential if we can be more challenge driven and identify what might scale and who can we partner with to get there, what role can universities play, it's really not hard to get uh, enthusiasm across campus to contribute to that, mm -hmm. and not just in the, the way that, in not just a one-dimensional way, but in a multi-dimensional way that we can have all these areas of scholarship, economics, policy, tech, working together to create that solution ahead. So, so the accelerator is, is about getting your research out of the lab into the marketplace is one example. Yeah, it's yes. also how to talk to investors, how to talk to policymakers, how okay. how to how to work together as a team so that we can create that that yes. interwoven fabric of the future together. Almost business ready. Business ready. That's exactly right. Good, good, good. Um, it sounds like you know. I want you said universities traditionally education research. You're definitely going beyond that. Is that correct, Aaron or Naomi? You know, do you want to? 
comment. Is that the case? Alan, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, this is part of reimagining academia. And as just to echo Tom, we have done a few things well. Um, we are good at fundamental research. We publish our papers, which is all good, which are necessary. But not everything that we do is actually scalable. Yeah. And I think the idea of reimagining, one of the reimagination, there are a few reimaginations. One of them is, can we think about scale from the beginning? Mm -hmm. For example, if you are to develop solutions for grid scale storage, right? we know long duration storage, we know it has to be one tenth the cost of lithium ion batteries because otherwise it just not economically does not make sense. But it also has to be at the 100 terawatt hour scale and E will tell you all about it. But what that does is that it constrains you with the materials you use, with the infrastructure you may need, right? And if you can leverage existing infrastructure, you can go faster. So same thing with, you know, uh, let's say hydrogen, you know, the hydrogen earth shot, right, that the DOE has, a few of us were involved in creating that whole model of, okay, dollar a kilogram within this decade. What is missing in that is the 100 million tons of hydrogen that we need to produce. When you put the scale along with the cost, the techno-economic target, it changes the ball game because we may have to look at a portfolio of solutions that can actually scale. And that changes the way you think, changes the way you do your research. And that's the part of the reimagination. The other part of the reimagination is how we educate. Some of these issues are not engineering issues or law issues or, or business. They're all of the above. The interplay between them is really important to understand for the students to be able to develop critical thinking skills to look at the, the sort of connecting the dots and then making the right decisions about what to do. Next step. Yeah. Yee, do you want to add I'll something? I'll add yeah. a little bit to, uh, you know, uh, just add a few points related to what Arun just said. Um, when you have a Stanford student coming in, whether it's undergrad and graduate students, a long time ago you ask them, they say, hey, I want to have a major discovery, right? So nowadays you ask the student, they say, some of them say, I still want to have the major discovery. That's fantastic. We continue doing that. We do that really well. But many students ask, how do I make a difference, make an impact to the world? That number, the percentage is actually increased a lot. I think the new school of uh, uh, sustainability accelerator, this really entertain this type of thinking. Yes. How do you make an impact, particularly to scale? I just look at myself in the last two years in the new school formation process, this uh, keyword scale and speed changed my own research program. I need to really see what's possible, see the end of the game first, come back to design my research. I think that has huge impact among our faculties and students. You can genuinely generate a solution that's scalable, put a scale right at the beginning. So this difference, imagine the next five, five, next five to 10 years, this keep propagating. I believe through the new school, there will be something scalable solution, very big impact solution will come out. So I'm very excited about it. So it's not technology for technology's sake. This, there's a bigger ball game and that's making a difference and, and this is about, about scale. Um, Naomi and, and Thomas, do you see that in your students as well, this interest to be a part of you know, a solution? Is that a driver? And Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I think back to when I was a graduate student and you know, I was focused on studying geophysics in the department. And, and now I look at the students and they're so much more worldly, so much more aware, so driven, I think, you know, and Stanford has set them up beautifully in this um, environment where they really get to embrace the whole um, sustainability uh, discipline outside of, you know, their departments. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Stanford has this startup culture, right? That's who we are. We were, you know, instrumental in sort of Silicon Valley um, being established, and the students embrace that. They are, you know, really driven to make a difference, and, and Stanford is a place that has a history of 
helping people do that. And I think more than ever, the students come in and we're all learning from each other in a community setting um, rather than it being a one-way flow of information, which is wonderful. That sounds very inspiring. Thomas, did you want to add something? Yeah. I, I fully agree. I, I would say that the students um, absolutely come in. I see so many students, they, they want to dedicate their life towards improving sustainability and making a difference in the world. I mean, it's at the level, kind of, to paraphrase Maverick from Top Gun, it's not what they are, it's who they are. That's what they want to do forever. So yeah, that's a great, a great, and they're bright, and they're, they're fired up, and uh, just as we, if we, it's up to us to really create outlets for that uh, creativity, that to channel that energy. Well, it's a good time to be studying, you know, in, in, your, uh, in your different uh, fields of research. It's Perhaps adding one thing. Um, so these, uh, to, today we talked to a number of industry folks. I also see um, it's the new school, particular accelerator, could open up new mechanism to engage industry in a very different way compared to before, even more powerful. Mm -hmm. For example, going from research to translation into the real world, going through this multi-step, Tom, using your terminology, is uh, the pre-pilot to pilot, right? In that zone of pre-pilot and pilot scale, engaging industry could be very different, you know, using this platform will be, I think, very effective. Yeah. I would also just add that the accelerator is about solutions at scale. It's certainly the technology and the business part is very important, but it's also policy. It's actually all hands on deck, whatever it takes, including education. Mm -hmm. Normally we educate about a few thousand students and maybe a few thousand executives or corporate, right? This has to go out to millions because their lives are going to get affected. And if you could reduce the barrier to access to education globally is something that is part of the accelerator. You know, that's again, it's all about scalability of education. How we do that with online, post-pandemic and all, we are still TBD, but that's the intent is to really take education to scale. So you're thinking about the future of how Stanford could provide education to a wider reach yes. beyond the physical campus and the lake. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. And if I may add to working professionals who are already in the energy space and want to kind of like kind of retool a bit and with the lens of sustainability and to professionals who aren't even working in the energy space at all, who have skills, who can bring, maybe they're working in software, working in yeah. semiconductors or what have you, and they want to apply their trade in the space and look into the, think about the, the next phase yeah. of their career. Yeah, it sounds like you want to erase a lot of the boundaries between business and education and research. So all of that is, is part of the program. That was Hugely exciting. Can we turn a little bit? I want to hear about your research. So can you pick um, one area of work that's happening in your department around you that you find exciting, that you find holds a little bit of promise, and tell us about it? Yay. Start. <laughs> OK. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to break the rules and talk about two things, but I'll keep two it brief. Fine. OK. Two things okay. Fine. So <laughs> in the Natural Gas Initiative, um, we have just got back from two months out in the Arizona desert. Um, we took 22 companies, um, methane detection technologies, and we actually released methane and we tested these technologies. So one of the things that I think you know, Stanford does really well, right, is provides a, a neutral ground for companies um, and uh, we have sort of become um, the um, assessor of these technologies, uh, working with both the service provider companies and the operators to come up with really effective cost, um, effective ways of uh, mitigating methane detection. So that's one thing that we've been doing. On the hydrogen side, um, we're working across the whole value chain, and there's a lot of uh, what you might expect, you know, in terms of um, nuts and bolts science work going on. But the project um, that I really um, am excited about right now is a pre-court pioneering project um, on decarbonizing steel. And um, I think, you know, really focusing on these uh, nuts that are hard to crack, yeah. particularly in these hard to abate sectors, um, is one of the things that Stanford can really bring to the table. Um, and, and it has huge implications, right, for um, not just decarbonizing steel, 
but then rolling out the technology to decarbonize other, other yeah. yeah heavy industry sectors. That does sound very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I have ten things to tell you, but I'll pick <laughs> maybe one or two. Um, Alune just come back from India a couple of weeks ago. It's very dangerous to put two people sitting to his next to each other to brainstorm. So in the whole flight, in the right? plane. Oh, in, the, in the plane. <laughs> so we have a lot of idea flashing. Also, I won't tell you that. So because we haven't worked on that yet. So let me tell you maybe just a couple of things. Uh, one is for my lab. So I work on for a long time. Uh, in addition to high energy density batteries for electrical transportation. I mean, this problem has been in my mind actually a decade ago, how to do long duration energy storage. Uh, about four or five years ago, uh, my lab invented this uh, new technology called, called nickel hydrogen gas battery. It's not nickel metal hydride, it's very different. This one ha has very long cycle life, 30,000 cycle, right? That's five, six times of lithium ion, 30 years lifetime, aqueous solution, extremely safe. When we, with recent analysis, we, we have a strong, uh, we believe this can go down below lithium ions cost in the system level. I, got this, I think this is a game changer. So I see Ashok is sitting right there, right? Ashok, this is very, very exciting. I think this is going to change the world. So, uh, well, let's, we look forward to push this to the market, yeah. uh, uh, translate into the market in the next couple of years. So this is one thing I want to tell you. Second thing is, Come back to what Alun just said. How do we get down to the cost 10 times lower for the long duration in the future when you go to 100 terawatt hour scale? And, uh, and inside Stanford, we put together a team to really analyze, hey, to get there, 100 terawatt hour, we need gigaton of batteries. We need solvent in the gigaton level. And how do you do that? Only water can do it. And then we need to re-innovate aqueous batteries. Right? You look at a battery's history, 160 years ago, that's aqueous solutions based. It was until about 30 years ago, lithium ion come along, organic electrolyte. People kind of forget about aqueous solution now. Now it's coming back. So to, it has the potential for 10x lower costs. I'm excited about. You sound very excited. Yes, no, that's great initiative. <laughs> um, Go ahead. So a couple of things. One is a, um, something that's going on in my lab. In one of the largest, biggest challenges in greenhouse gases is methane. And you know, this is methane detection. Um, and what we're detecting is actually not a good story because there's a lot of methane that is leaking from the Permian Basin, et cetera. So we have focused on atmospheric methane removal. And this is going to be hard. The only way you can remove it is actually oxidize it. And the way nature does it is through UV light, uh, breaking ozone into oxygen molecule and an oxygen-free radical, which other forms other radicals to actually activate methane, uh, which is very hard to activate, but it activates at room temperature, and then you got the methyl radical, and then it's sort of a cascading down to CO2. Once it converts to CO2, we know how to take it out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis. So what we are trying to do is to replicate that using UV light to produce free radicals. And you know, methane is at uh, 2 ppm. That's the atmospheric concentration. In other regions, it's about 1,500, 400 ppm or so. But in the atmosphere, it's 2 ppm. And that comes not just from natural gas, from agriculture, from paddy, from livestock, et cetera. So that's 2 ppm. And so it's been very hard to oxidize methane below 100 ppm. Right now, we are doing 30 ppm. We're trying to push it down to 2 ppm. It looks good, but there's a long way ahead in terms of trying to get down to 2 ppm in an energy efficient way using background UV light. And so there are a lot of science that has to be and engineering that needs to be done. So that's one. The other one is this is a group effort on Stanford in partnership with Google. And that is on data. And there's a lot of data out there in, form, in terms of demographic data, in terms of you know, household income, um, emissions data, where the solar panels are, and you know, temperature data, weather data, and climate predictions of the future. 
all of that. So what, one of the things we are doing with Google is to create a worldwide web of data. So you can, I can share the data with you, and you can use my data, and I can use your data to, to understand something better in the energy, climate, and sustainability space. And, and so one of the use cases that we're going to launch is that you know, in COVID, you had the Johns Hopkins website. So you could click on any country and find out how many cases, how many deaths, how, many how much vaccination, and all of that. We don't have anything on climate on weather extremes. And so we are launching this in live data on what are the issues going on. For example, there was this, this is right now going on, a massive famine and drought in East Africa. There was a, a just biblical flood in Pakistan where 500 people died, the glaciers melted, and there was torrential rain. And you know, so one can attribute to climate and all of that, and that will be done. But the actual human impact of that, what was the human response? What is the human impact? Mm -hmm. That story comes in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and just goes away. Yes. We cannot forget that. We got to retain the lessons learned from that. We cannot forget those people. So the lessons learned from that, so that when there's another flood somewhere else in the world, perhaps we could use those lessons. So that's a repository of extreme events that we are just launching right now in partnership with Google pooling data for the greater good, See, for everyone to be able to use that's it. That's right. Yeah. No one will ever have to do data wrangling in the future if we can collect our data sets, put in, essentially it's the same format, like just like in websites, you have HTML, and, and so that's a format, right? So, and that you can now link websites. The same thing should be possible with data if the format is the right one. So that's the thing that we are kind of launching right now. That sounds great. Thomas. Great, yeah, some examples there. Hydrogen's a big one that yeah. we work in. A lot of excitement across the globe of approximately 100 gigawatts of announced projects uh, for water electrolysis. And uh, the challenge is really, do we have the technology that can hit the, the cost targets that steam methane uh, reforming can provide, which is about, in the US, a little over a dollar a kilogram. Very, very difficult to do. We're taking a couple of different approaches. One approach, uh, this is funded through the Hydrogen Initiative, is we're taking, you know, US taxpayer dollars have paid for a number of synchrotrons facilities across the United States, the US national labs that can do some pretty exciting advanced forms of characterization. We're taking that and we're building electrolyzers that are compatible with the synchrotron beam lines so we can get molecular and atomic scale insights to how they operate, under, try to understand what are the bottlenecks, how do, we, how do we unlock new designs ahead based on that information. Another project we're working on is try to make electrolyzers that are resilient with respect to the feedstock. Instead of sending in super high purity water, which is what PEM electrolyzers require, can we get them to run off of tap water? Can we get them to run off of seawater? And, and that has all kinds of ions and other things in there that will absolutely mess up the conventional technology. So we're, trying to, we're coming up with new designs that, that are resilient and thus can be cheaper because you don't need to have all that water purification up front. And carbon dioxide, we spent out a couple of companies, one called Dioxical, another called 12 that you'll find around here at this conference, um, building CO2 electrolyzers, kind of like a water electrolyzer, except for you're sending in humidified CO2. You can make things like ethylene, you can make ethanol, carbon monoxide, great platform chemicals from there. You can take it on forward, make sustainable aviation fuels, for instance. Another big molecule for us is ammonia. Ammonia is already a massively worldwide produced molecule, very key to feed all of us in the room and billions of others not in the room. And ammonia could also be a great fuel for maritime and for aviation. The question is, can you make it sustainably and thus avoid carbon in the first place? And so we're working on processes. We've demonstrated that we can do this electrified processes to take nitrogen, which is 78% of what you're, you have in your lungs right now, uh, turn that into, into ammonia, and then, which could be used for a lot of different applications, yeah. including uh, as a sustainable fuel. Yes, difficult to abate transports, yeah, absolutely. So I realize we've talked a bit too long, but I do want to open it up to questions in the room. Yes, wonderful, do, uh, yeah, I think a microphone, there we go, is on its way, thank you. Thank you. It's not, okay. Uh, Josh Shaver from Electron Capital, thank you for that. I guess previously in some discussions years past, there was a lot of, uh, talk about solar panels and new technologies like perovskites and that sort of thing, but I haven't heard anything lately with respect to that. Is there anything new on uh, the possibility of perovskites and, and being durable enough to to be a, to be a new panel? E, you want to say? Sure. Um, I think in terms of PV solar cells, 
that's, this is really a lucky case. Silicon panel alone already reduced the cost so low right now. Making ProScat to work, particularly overlay with silicon made efficiency higher will push that even more. I would say that's a really scalable technology for silicon. ProScat will add additional one coming. So I basically, basically take the PV area, it's getting close to be the done deal. Just keep scaling. Uh, what's missing is actually storage, long duration storage. Which and I would say the, the stability of the perovskites, that's a lot yeah. of work going on yeah. to make them much more stable and environmentally benign. And so that's, that's what's, uh, yeah. Uh, we've got a question right here. Thank you. Hi, uh, David Zitun, head of the chemistry at bar -Ilan. Um What are you doing to like merge the innovation from all the universities like you got a lot in California going, and I think that the challenge is big enough so that we should forget about the borders between Berkeley and Stanford and UC. So is there anything going on with that? To tell you what, first, is Alun and I uh, both uh, used to be in Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no border right there. I'll, I'll add to it, yeah. absolutely. No, we partner a ton. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, there's a, uh, the USA uh, launched about a decade ago, um, uh, uh, the solar fuels hubs. There were a number of hubs that were launched and uh, currently there are two, one's called Lisa and one's called Chase. The Lisa one is a partnership between Berkeley, uh, so Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Berkeley, uh, Stanford, SLAC, uh, Caltech, uh, UC Irvine, <coughs> Um, University of Oregon, a couple other partners. And so there's, what, I, what we're seeing, that's just one example of partnerships. And the Department of Energy is a lot of the, the funding that they're putting out there. They're expecting big teams to tackle big challenges. So, so that is one kind of route that we're using to partner. And I couldn't agree more. That's, uh, it makes all the sense in the world to bring the different capabilities and expertise and perspectives. I think given the global challenge, we, we need a myriad of solutions that work across the globe. There's no one size fits all. And so, uh, so I think that's, that's a good approach. When Stanford. it comes to, sorry, go ahead. Stanford's also um, part of something called the Energy Leadership Institute, which is a number of universities from across the country, and recognizing that every university has its own set of strengths, right? And um, our commitment is to educate mid-career energy professionals such that they have a broader understanding of the entire energy landscape by visiting Stanford to learn about innovation or Columbia to learn about policy. And together, um, as a set of universities, we can kind of give a uh, even more deep education to those already out making decisions in the energy world. I was gonna just say that, look, when it comes to football, or basketball, yes, we compete with, with Cal. But when it comes to science and engineering and, and partnership, there's a, f a lot of things going on between I the think two schools. Great way to conclude the panel. <laughs> really nice note. Um, I want to thank you all. I, I really took away the lessons that you are you know, reinventing, pushing academia out of its you know, initial shell and into the world. I like the focus about scale. I think that's so interesting that you're looking at the work that you do with the idea that you know it needs to work in the real world. Um, we, we didn't get a chance to talk, but I feel that the school is also very involved in, in social justice and making sure that what you do here or in California is going to have an impact outside of the US and focusing on developing countries which may not have um, the resources that we have to push this research through. So I think that would have been an angle to discuss, but it's, uh, it's, it sounds like you're definitely on top we, of that. Absolutely. We have yeah. a social sciences division within the school we are recruiting, our first recruits are economists, and we are now got a faculty position out for environmental justice. Uh, we think this is not just, this is a domestic issue for sure. This is also an international issue. And I think this is something that we want to lean into. And again, provide the, the balance between science and engineering on one hand, and the social science and humanities on the other. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for your contributions. I think it's hugely interesting comments today and very helpful for everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Coralie. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for attending. Please check the Innovation Agora agenda for upcoming Hub, Pod, and Lyceum sessions. Our next session in this studio will begin shortly.